Now let's learn about the individuals who helped establish Gestalt psychology. Max Wertheimer is one of the founders of Gestalt psychology. He was born in Germany and earned his PhD from the University of Würzburg and studied with Oswald Kuppe. He also studied at the University of Berlin with Karl Stumpf, an individual that has a connection and association with all three founders of Gestalt psychology. Wertheimer also studied with Muller, one of the individuals that we learned about earlier in the semester. After grad school, Wertheimer ended up at the University of Frankfurt in 1910. This is where he met Kurt Kafka. They would eventually become friends and go on to work together and found Gestalt psychology together. In 1912, Wertheimer published the founding article of Gestalt psychology. It was called Experimental Studies on the Perception of Movement. It was this article that led a lot of people to associate Gestalt psychology with perception. They studied a lot more than just perception, but the founding article and many of the titles of the other important works in Gestalt psychology, they all had the word perception in the title. So this led many people to think that Gestalt psychologists only studied perception, which was not true, but also contributed to this perspective's demise. In 1923, he wrote about many of the principles we learned about earlier. He described them, explained them, gave examples of them. The principles of perceptual organization were a prominent idea in Gestalt psychology. It was something that many individuals wrote about, including the founders. In 1933, he began promoting his ideas in the United States. In just a few slides, I'm going to explain a little bit more about how Gestalt psychology came to the United States. I'll give you a hint. It does have something to do with Adolf Hitler and World War II. In his founding article, he wrote about something called the Phi Phenomenon. Some people call it the apparent motion effect, but he didn't like that label because he felt like it didn't clearly describe what was going on. The Phi Phenomenon is the tendency for two lights that are flashed very quickly after one another in two different locations. The tendency for those two lights to appear as though it's one light moving. Let me show you an example to explain. On the left is what we show participants. Two different lights, two different locations, and we show them very quickly after one another. Milliseconds exist between these two flashes of light. On the right is what the human actually sees and experiences. Although it's technically in our geographical environment, two different lights, in our behavioral environment, we see one light moving from the first spot to the second spot. Our brains don't recognize that there's two separate flashing lights. We just see one continuous motion from one place on the screen to another. The Phi phenomenon is what makes watching movies possible. Film, motion pictures, movies, everything we watch on Netflix, everything we watch on phone on our phones is based on this human tendency for us to take two images that are placed back to back very quickly and fill in the missing pieces. Even as you're watching this video, you're actually watching thousands and thousands of still images shown right after one another. Kurt Kafka was also a German psychologist and the second founder of Gestalt psychology. In 1909, he earned his PhD from the University of Berlin, where, if you remember, Karl Stumpf was teaching. Now, Stumpf had already taught Wertheimer, and now we can see that he was Kafka's supervisor as well. After graduation, Kafka moves to the University of Frankfurt, 
And from 1910 until 1913, Kafka and Kuhler helped Wertheimer conduct some of his perception studies. Now, when I say assisted, I mean that Kafka was a participant in Wertheimer's studies. He didn't necessarily help conduct the studies. He served as a person who provided data. Of the three founders, Kafka gets credit for bringing Gestalt psychology to the United States, and he did it in several ways. First, he wrote about Gestalt psychology in terms of development, how we develop these perceptual tendencies throughout our lives. He published that article in 1921. Then the next year in 1922, he published the article that is considered the introductory article to Gestalt psychology for American psychologists. The name of that article was Perception, an Introduction to Gestalt Theory. Then in the mid-1920s, he visited both Cornell University and the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Both of these universities asked him to talk about Gestalt psychology and his research related to perception, problem-solving, decision-making, the principles of perceptual organization. Eventually, these two visits would help him get a job in the United States. He moved to the United States in 1927 and stayed at Smith College until 1941. In 1935, he wrote about Gestalt psychology in one of his most famous books, Principles of Gestalt Psychology. If you click on the link, you can take a look at this original document. This article helped unite Gestalt psychologists. We could think of it as the guidebook for all Gestalt psychologists. It included everything that we've talked about in this lecture and more. With Kafka's biography, we can see that Gestalt psychology made its way to the United States in the 1920s and became at least more popular in the 1930s before it eventually gets replaced by behaviorism. Wolfgang Kuhler was also a German psychologist and the best known, the most popular of the three founders of Gestalt psychology. In 1909, he also earned his PhD from the University of Berlin and also studied with Carl Stumpf. Notice that all three of the founders had an experience with Carl Stumpf. And notice that both Kafka and Kuhler graduated the same year from the same university and had the same supervisor. As you can imagine, these two individuals knew each other very well, worked well together, and helped spread Gestalt psychology as a team. So after graduation, he also moves to the University of Frankfurt. And for three years from 1910 until 1913, he and Kafka participated in Wertheimer's perception studies. The same year that these three founders stopped doing Wertheimer's research, Kuhler got an opportunity to direct some animal behavior research on the Canary Islands, which are west of Morocco. For six years, he studied chimpanzee behavior, particularly how they learn and how they solve problems. On the bottom of the screen, you can see an example of one of the problems that the chimps were observed trying to solve. He would hang bananas from the ceiling, way out of reach, and watch as the chimps try to figure out how to get the food. Over time, the chimps learned how to first stack the crates on top of one another, second, climb on top of the stack of crates, and third, use the stick to swat the bananas down from the ceiling. Many of the chimps did eventually figure it out. Based on his observations, he drew some conclusions about animal perception. In 1917, Kuhler published his results and his conclusions in The Mentality of Apes. He strongly disagreed with Edward Thorndike's trial and error learning. 
Thorndike also called it trial and accidental success learning because again, there was no real strategy behind the cat's escape. They just tried a bunch of stuff until something worked and they got out of the box. With the chimps, something different appeared to happen. Their solution to the problem of the banana hanging from the ceiling, their solution came quickly through insight. They all of a sudden realized, oh, I could maybe stack those crates to get higher and closer to the bananas. Now, admittedly, cats are not as smart as primates. So it very well could have been that Thorndike was studying cats learning and Cooler was studying chimpanzee learning. But they definitely disagreed in terms of how it happened. Thorndike said it happens gradually over time and it happens by trial and error. Cooler said it happens more quickly and it happens by thinking outside of the box, by reconfiguring the problem that is in front of us. In Thorndike's study, the cats were inside the puzzle box and were not able to see the puzzle box from the outside. For this reason, Cooler said that Thorndike's studies were not actually studying learning. They were studying learning under specific circumstances. When he returned from the Canary Islands just after World War I ended, he was accused of being a spy. Cooler got a lot of attention because he was accused of being a spy, which means more people are talking about him at dinner, more people are asking questions, more people are reading his articles, his books, more people are trying to become familiar with who is this guy and why are they accusing him of being a spy? The reason he came back to Germany was because Carl Stumpf was leaving the University of Berlin and wanted Cooler to take over his position as the director of the Psychology Institute. The other major event that helped popularize Cooler as a Gestalt psychologist was his book published in 1929. He called it Gestalt Psychology. This book was more popular than Kafka's book, it was shorter, it was easier to read, it was written for anyone who was interested in Gestalt psychology. Several years after publishing his very popular book, he moved to the United States. He started teaching at Clark University and then moved to Swarthmore College. He came to the United States because he was appalled by what was happening in Nazi Germany. Now he wasn't Jewish, he did not fear for his life, but he had many Jewish colleagues, including Wertheimer and Kafka. He did not like that the Nazi regime fired his Jewish colleagues in 1933. So it was only two years after Hitler's um, legislation was put into place in 1933 that Cooler had had enough and decided to move to the United States. Like the other two founders, when he came to the United States, he brought with him Gestalt psychology. And to show you just how popular Cooler became, in 1958, he was elected president of the APA.